So I'm Ken, my name is Ken Free. I'm, I run one of the product teams at Pluralsight, specifically uh, the content tools team. So we build products for our internal content uh, members as well as our authors, uh, our experts on our platform who, uh, who create the content on Pluralsight. And what I want to spend a little bit of time on today is uh, as we are talking to customers and just thinking about how we would design or build the experience, like how do we remove our own personal bias uh, in that? And then how do we really, once we've zeroed in on what the right thing is to build, how do we then communicate that effectively to the important people in our organization who are gonna help us deliver on this experience? Uh, because in my experience, those have been a couple hard things to do. Um, I want this to be useful to you. I have not been here all day and heard all the talk. So if there's something that you feel like you've heard before that's not useful, don't throw fruit at me or anything, but feel free to like raise your hand and just be like, hey, let's move it on. And, and we'll make sure that we keep this uh, as useful for you guys as, as, as possible. So um, I kind of just touched on that. Uh, so I want to start off with my grandma. This is Grandma Free. And uh, I think that Grandma Free looks like the tip, like a movie grandma. Like a tip, she's got the awesome like white hair, the good perm going on there. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but she has uh, you know the loose fitting clothing with on her shirt. She has like little puppy dogs on there, which is like the ultimate grandma thing. Uh, but I put Grandma Free up here because uh, Grandma Free. I'm named after her husband. So my name's Ken. Her husband's name is Ken. And her husband was a farmer uh, his whole life, and so Grandma Free knows absolutely nothing about uh, technology, really. She's the kind of grandma that always forgets her password. Her password, like, uh, storage thing that she uses in, like, LastPass, it's my mom. My mom has to remember all the passwords for Grandma Free. So that's the kind of person Grandma Free is, like, typical grandma. And she asks me all the time, um, something that I'm sure maybe your grandma has asked you, which is what do you do? And it's really hard to explain that to her because you're trying to explain like, oh, I'm a product manager, and it's like, well, what is that? Um, and like, there's just a generational gap, and so it's really hard to like make that connection. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about what does a good product manager, or in this case, like a, a designer do? And I think, you know, they're, they're very much the same thing. So this is my grandma-free answer. I've tried to like boil this down into something simple that uh, you can use on your grandmas out there. So I think a good product manager does a couple things. Number one, gets to know the, the customer and identifies the right problem to solve. And then number two, communicates that problem effectively to the rest of the organization so that everyone can rally around the right problems and solve that problem effectively. Now, there's a couple roadblocks like I mentioned a minute ago that I think get in the way of actually doing these, these things well. One is, like I said, our personal bias. No matter who you are, um, this will come into play when you're talking to customers or when you're trying to design a solution. And there's all kinds of strategies and processes and all these things out there that hopefully help us avoid doing that. But e I found even as I do, do like the right practices in product design, like I'll get down the road and all the parts that don't work in the product I've built always seem to come because I made assumptions based on my biases that I wasn't able to effectively like, get out early on in the process. So this is something I think we all experience. And then the other thing is, um, just along those, the lines of communication, it's really hard then to synthesize all the information we get and make it consumable, consumable and memorable for other people. So, you know, you guys will be deep in the weeds of talking to customers, of, of creating these initial designs that will become the product. Um, but when you're trying to explain it to somebody else, like, it's got to be done in a way where it's easy for them to take action on it. And I found that to be, you know, very, very difficult. So what I want to do is kind of go through um, some of the processes that, that I practice before and during customer interviews to help do those things more effectively. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like how we structure our teams, um, what are some of the processes that we have, and then what are some interview practices we can do to, to eliminate bias and then to communicate the right things to the rest of the organization effectively. Um, so let's talk about product teams. Um, or I, I, it's probably better said as experience teams is, is what I would call them. So at Pluralsight, we organize our teams like this. So have a product manager, a, a UX designer, um, and then a team of engineers. 
And again, thinking about how we eliminate bias and how we get on the right solution. So I think it's super critical in your teams that you involve all of these people in each part of the process as much as possible. Um, where bias comes in is when you have single points of failure, I think. So if your product manager or if you as a designer are spending the time interviewing the customers and then telling the developers what they should build, there's like, now the people who are actually building the product are one step removed from the actual customer. And that's a chance for bias to come in, for information to get lost, and for you to kind of start going down the road of building the wrong thing. So one way you can protect against that is by having all these people involved in each step of the process. So when we interview customers, we'll have at least one engineer there, and myself and our designer, and we will all talk to the customers. That helps us all get on the same page with what the customer is saying, and again, helps take out like the chance for any one person to bias the information that comes from the customers. Um, the other thing that it does is it brings different perspectives when we actually start designing what the product should be. As a product manager, I may have one thought for what we could build, but designers think very differently. I mean, you guys are very much more creative. Um, you have a better eye for like how visually how it should look. Developers think totally differently than that. They understand like what are the technical challenges that we might have. Um, how can we build this to scale? And so everyone comes at it with a different perspective. And by bringing that to the table, like not only can we eliminate bias, but we can get uh, closer to the right solution much more quickly. The other thing that I think is really important is in the process that you have for building products, to have both uh, a mechanism for getting qualitative and quantitative feedback, and making sure that the customer is at the heart of all the feedback that you get. So I'm gonna show you what our process looks like at Pluralsight. I don't mean this to be prescriptive and that you have to do it exactly like this, but just as an example for um, how we try to get both qualitative and quantitative feedback and how you can do this with both talking to customers and with the things that you design. So we use a process called directed discovery and it starts with uh, a very qualitative thing um, which is just talking to customers. So we will go and interview uh, customers and the goal is to understand how they view the problems that they're dealing with. What solutions have they used in the past and just really put ourselves in their shoes to understand like where they're at right now. Once we go through that process and we feel confident that we have kind of figured out a little bit what that problem is, that's when we all get in the room and we'll all kind of um, give our ideas of what some potential solution could look like. So we'll get in a room, we'll kind of write that out on a white piece of paper, and then at the end of the day, then the UX designer will take that and kind of combine all those ideas and produce a high fidelity mock-up that we can go and test with customers. We call those CPTs or customer preference testing. Um, this is where some quantitative feedback starts to come in. So we'll take those designs back to customers now, and we want to have 80% confidence before we go on to the next step. 80% confidence for us looks like, do at least 80% of the people, can they go through the, like, the process of our solution successfully? Um, if they can't, then we'll keep iterating on that design until we get it right. Then we'll go to what we call customer confirmation testing, which is basically our slow release process to general release. So we'll start with a pre-alpha group, and then an alpha group, and a beta, and then general release. And at each point, um, we want to make sure, again, we have 80% success with what we built. And the way we measure that is usually through NPS, or like a five-star rating. Um, and so you can see, I mean, my point of this, without trying to get too much in the weeds of our process, is like combining qualitative and quantitative feedback with your customers is critical for making sure that that bias gets taken out of as you go through the process. Um, the next thing I want to briefly touch on that I, I think is really important for doing the, for, for eliminating this bias, is creating a great discussion guide before you interview customers. So if you're going to spend time with customers, um, too often I've made the mistake of just kind of going and, and talking to customers like on a whim and not really having like a plan for how I'm going to go about that. Um, so the first thing that you want to do before you do that is make sure you have a clear outcome for these customer interviews so you can create an unbiased discussion guide. Now, what does that look like? This is actually one of the discussion guides that we've used before, and you'll see that we, like, for every one, we'll write down, like, what the, our goal is, and then what we expect we might see as we go and interview these customers. So that everyone, like the, the product guy, the designer, and the, and the engineers, are on the same page for like, what are we looking for and what do we hope to get out of this? Um, 
Then what we'll do is we will have several people actually proofread the questions that we are going to talk to the customers about. Um, and the goal of this is like, the first, it's just like writing sort of any kind of like blog post or documentation of any kind. Like usually the stuff you write first is not the stuff you're gonna to wanna to like go to battle with because you know, it's your first guess at it. Oftentimes you write questions in a way that naturally tend to, or like naturally biased, and so you're gonna get a certain kind of answer from your customer. And so you wanna have people proofread that and say like, have we asked this in a way um, that allow our users to describe problems more than just like specific workflow. Too often people like to say like, this is how we do it right now. And what, we, what you wanna get at is like, well why do you do it that way? Like what problem are you trying to solve? Um, why are you doing that workflow so that we can really get in, in your head? And so you wanna make sure the questions are worded so that you can get those kind of answers. And then the other thing you wanna do is like, as you then actually start talking to customers, you're gonna to wanna to keep tweaking this because I know a lot of times like I think the question is good and I get into an interview with a customer and then I, you realize like every answer they're getting back is like not what you're expecting or like a good answer or they don't understand the question. And so this is something that you're gonna to wanna to keep iterating on as you talk to customers uh, to make sure that you really dial in what those questions are. But by spending the time here, um, you can make sure that you actually have a clear understanding of what customers are looking for, so that when you start designing a solution, like you're doing that on, on the right foot. Um, and then when you actually conduct the interviews, again I mentioned, I think it's so important that each one of those team members involved at every step along the way. So when we do this, you'll see that we have our product manager, our developer, our designer, all talking to the customers at the same time. And again, the goal is to, show, like, to close that gap between what the customer actually says and who is actually building the experience. It's just like playing that game of telephone. Like the more people that passes through, the more that key information is gonna get lost. So I think this is really, really critical. The other thing, and this is gonna kind of dive in like the meat of what I wanna talk about today is recording the interviews. So when you record that, this will give you a chance to actually go back and, and process the data in different ways to make sure that you're again eliminating that bias and that you have some uh, documentation that you can use to share with the rest of the organization. So um, now, like I said, I kind of want to get in the weeds of what I want to talk about. So once you have these interviews um, and you've created a great discussion guide, you've got that data from the user, like what do you do with it? So again, we want to make sure that whatever we do, it's going to eliminate bias. Uh, we want to make sure that it's going to organize the ideas and, and the problems that come from these customers effectively that we prioritize them based on the level of pain that a customer is feeling, and then again, that we can clearly communicate these to the key you know, stakeholders in our organization. So we could not think of a good name for this process, like my, my UX partner, my engineers are trying to like think of something clever we could call this. So we call this the Minimum Viable Product Process, or for short, the MVPP. So um, hopefully that'll help you remember it a little bit better. So, uh, so here's something that we've done. So once we get those interviews, again, like I said, we, we record these. Um, but something we've started doing that I've found has really been helpful is we have started transcribing uh, these recordings. So a lot of times what will happen when you have a customer interview is like you'll get together and you'll talk right after that. Um, and you'll take some notes. But then like those notes aren't really shareable because they're kind of chicken scratch. And a lot of times like that conversation you have right after the interview, like you forget. And so again, then when it actually comes time to start designing what the solution would look like, you're right back to like, just use my own personal bias and what I remembered from that or what stuck out, stuck out to me. And, and now we're down that path of like potentially building the wrong thing. So something we've started doing is we will actually start, like I said, transcribing uh, these recordings. And once we get those transcriptions back, um, we will go through and read those, and at each one of those, we'll start taking notes. And the things that we're looking for as we do that are like, what is the background of the interview subject? What is the context of the problems they describe it? What are the processes that they describe that they might go through? Any pains, like are there any kind of journeys they go through? What tools, what data are they looking for? What kind of workarounds have they, have they developed? And so to give you like a really clear example of this, like this is a, a Google Doc, of, this is the transcription of one of our interviews. And you'll see like I've gone through and just started like listing things. So like for this particular feature we were building or this tool is we're working on an author dashboard. Our authors, our authors are the people who create the content of plural site. And so I kind of made a note like awareness. This author didn't even know what the author dashboard was. 
Um, here's kind of a journey they went through, like to actually get work done. Here's some of the tools that, that this person used. And so we go through and we would make these notes. Uh, and the thing that really was amazing to me about this as we did this was reading back through the interview, we got a completely different picture of what the customer wanted than what I remembered from that interview. And again, going back to that whole bias thing, like in your head, because you think you might already know what the solution to the problem is, I found that you tend to hear those kind of things from the customer. So like I, I remember for this one in particular, like every time they kind of said one of those keywords that I was thinking, it's like, oh yeah, they, they totally talked about that all the time. Like, I, yeah, I was right. And then reading back through this, it was like, actually, no, like I think he only mentioned that once. And he was actually really concerned about this whole other piece of the product. And so you really start to like dial in on, number one, where your biases are, but you get that whole second look at what the customer actually said. The other thing that I think this really does is it helps you, as someone who's trying to understand what the customer needs, just get better at your interviewing techniques. It's really painful when you read uh, on paper, like all your kind of like uh, speaking, you know, secrecy things that you do. Um, and the way you ask questions, you get to really practice that and get a lot better at that. So this helps in more ways than one. So once, once we went through and we actually did this transcription process, um, then we wanted to synthesize all this information into something that somebody who was not in that interview could read in five to 10 minutes and could understand and be on the same page uh, as myself and my UX designer were when we were actually in the interview. So that was kind of the goal of this. So we took all of those kind of notes on the side of that transcription and we basically created like a profile for each, uh, for each interview that we did. Um, so for this, you'll see like on the side, like we, we created, well, you know, what's the professional background of this person? How many courses have they done? How many years have they been doing it? You know, what is the, their area of expertise? Where do they live? And we, we tried to get at least five key insights out of each one of those interviews from those transcriptions. And then if, if there was any other just sort of interesting tidbits that we had. So we, we would take those notes, we would put it in here. Um, and then because you guys are designers, this is like super ugly. So we went ahead and let our designer, you know, mess around with this and actually turn this into something that looked good that we could share around with the organization. And the thing that was really powerful about this is not all of our developers were able to be on every call. And again, like we want our developers to be as close to the customers as possible so that they can build the right solution. So they could, we could give them something like this, and again, within a couple minutes, they could read and like know what the key takeaways of that interview was. The other thing you can use this for is like a lot of times I hear product managers say like, I feel like I have to convince leadership like why we should go down this specific path, or I feel like I have to like. Uh, give information clearly to product marketing because they never tell the right story to the customer and actually like sell our product or whatever, right? These are great documents that you can use to help other people in the organization who need to know that information get on the same page with you and understand where the customers are coming from and understand the why of what you guys are building. So we, we would kind of create these, these interview <laughs> profiles. Um, then what we would do is we would actually then kind of create a needs map from these insights. So trying to pull together these common themes that we got there with the goal of determining what would be our MVP for this product. So we would take like the highlights from each one of those interviews and we would group them into themes. So you can see here for this particular product, um, there was like a, uh, a big theme around course success metrics. Uh, people wanted to see them all in one location. Uh, people had talked about star rating. There was a big uh, theme around like the royalties that our authors are actually making from these courses. They wanted greater insights into like um, how much they're making, like so they could predict better, like what you know, what kind of money would be coming in for their courses. And then there was huge theme around data, like what, uh, how well did, does my course do once uh, I publish it? Like how do users interact with it? How do I know if they liked it? If it's kind of accomplishing the goals that I have for it. So we, we grouped all those from the interviews into kind of key themes. And then we started to create some user stories from that and, and create like a, a needs map or a journey map. So uh, this is like a very, very simple journey map. But basically we saw that there were sort of three stages that came out of this, uh, of these particular inter interviews. There was like a, a workflow and a stage that happened before a course was created for our authors. Um, there was a lot of problems and pains they described that happened during the process of creating a course. 
And then there was all kinds of stuff around the data that they wanted after a course was published to know if they'd been successful. And so from those transcriptions and that needs map, we were able to you know, kind of categorize where this stuff landed in that whole author journey. And each one of these dots then kind of represented how many authors had described this as a problem. And so creating a document like this, again, makes it really easy then to go to either your developers or your leadership or whoever and say, here's, what we're, here's the direction we're gonna go and here's why. Um, you know, we're probably not gonna spend too much time on this particular like need, but like, wow, once the course is published, like every author is describing the same problems with the data that they're looking for. And so by going through this process again, like number one, like hopefully you've now looked at this, the data in multiple different ways with multiple different people, so that bias is gone. And, and then this helps you kind of create like real documents that you can then hand out through your organization to rally people around. So here's some of the benefits that we, we saw from this. So um, this allowed us to focus more deeply during the customer interviews. I was far less worried about like trying to frantically take notes myself um, because I knew that I was going to go back and read the transcription of that interview later. It allowed me to really just like be present with the customer and more kind of try to feel their pain, which I think was really, really helpful. Um, the other thing, like I said, this allowed us to look at the information in a new light. I think the more ways you can look at the information, the more closely you will be able to kind of peg what that customer problem is. Um, this opened up a lot of opportunities for us to discover things that we didn't catch in the interview. Um, it helped us create the artifacts to determine what would go into our MVP for that product. Helped us synthesize that information, like I mentioned, for other people. Um, and then this was a big one for me. Like a lot of times, we'll find that we will do customer interviews, and then like your developers, like once you design the product, sometimes it'll take them a while to kind of catch up from a build perspective to what you've done with the kind of dis discovery with the customer. And so, like customers sometimes, and. And then like two months later or something, like we're finally ready to build whatever it is that we discovered a couple months ago. And then our developers are trying to understand like, well, why are we building it this way? And I'm always like, you know, to be honest, like I don't remember that well, because um, it's been two months. So like, just build it that way, trust me, because that's what I thought two months ago. Um, but having some documentation like this and having gone through a process like this, allowed us to have some really clear things that we could go back to and refresh our memory on, oh, that's right, like that's why the customer said that. Like, I, I remember that now. And that was really, really helpful for us um, as we worked with our developers. And then, like I said, it helps take away the bias uh, that you experience during those customer interviews. And then the last thing I think here is tracking your research. So just having documentation for what you've actually done. So there are some challenges to this. Uh, and I would love if anybody has any suggestions uh, on this. But this can be a little time consuming. Like if you actually go through and transcribe every customer interview that you do, um, it, it just takes a while to go through and read that. And so we don't always have the time to do this every single time. So kind of the rule we've implemented for ourselves um, is if we're building like a very large experience um, that will require like multiple features and it's you know something very big we're delivering, we do go through this kind of process. If we're kind of doing like plus ones or improvements or slight tweaks to uh, a product that we already have, then we don't go through such a detailed process. So we kind of pick and choose our battles and make sure that we're using our time you know, efficiently. Um, and then the way you actually use the information that comes out of these transcripts um, will really just kind of depend on what the situation is. So we created kind of those needs map and the journey map and all those things. But whatever like output that you want to create with that information really depends on, um, yeah, what, what situation you're in. There's not a one size fits all kind of thing. So you'll have to use some judgment of like, what can we do with this information so that it suits the needs that we have for this particular product at this particular time. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of a challenge there. Um, Really, so just to kind of conclude here, um, hopefully this has been helpful for, for you just to think of new ways that you might be able to look at user information, user data. Um, I think if you do this, or a process like this, you'll find that the stuff you're designing is much more close to like the mark for what customers actually need. Um, I think you'll also find that you're able to uh, rally the people on your team to build the right stuff easier. Like you'll have a better time getting buy-in from leadership. You'll have a better time communicating this to your developers. 
Um, I know that we have seen that on plural side, um, and so hopefully that's been helpful for you guys today. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, good question. So the question he asked was, during customer interviews, um, a lot of times customers will bring up problems like all across the product, like maybe not for the specific feature set or like uh, that you're working on currently. How do you kind of rein in those uh, pieces of feedback so that's focused in on like what you're actually trying to build? Is that right? Um, yeah, good question. So for that, I found it's just best to. Um, to be direct with the customers. Like a lot of times for us, cu well, customers are like really excited that you want to talk to them and you want their opinion. And so they, they'll kind of like bomb it out like everything they ever thought about the product that's wrong. And so I, I think it's just good just to be direct and say, hey, we really appreciate that. I'm gonna make a note of that. Um, for this particular interview, we're trying to focus on like these parameters. Um, we will come back to that later, at, you know, at a future date. But uh, if you wouldn't mind, like, let's just stay focused on this. Most people aren't offended. Um, I think another good thing to do is just, before the interview starts, to set clear expectations with the customer uh, for what you want to talk about. So just say, hey, you know, here, we're here today, we're trying to focus on this specific feature set, um, so we'd love your feedback on that part in particular. And as long as you're clear and polite with the customers, I mean, I've never had anyone be upset with, you know, with kind of, trying to redirect the focus to the right thing. Yeah, yeah but... Do you have any examples of discussion guides that you use uh, and how you go about getting those to be better, uh, to be better those? Yeah. I mean, so every discussion guide is different. So every time we're gonna interview customers, like we, are, at least our team, we always start with a blank piece of paper. And, uh, Again, what we'll always start with is like, what is the outcome we're trying to achieve with this? Like, what feature set are we are we working on? Um, what are the things that we want to know when we're done with customer interviews? And so we'll start with those, you know, those statements of like, we want to know X, Y, and Z. Um, and then we'll just start brainstorming like the questions, like, well, what questions could we ask to get the answers to that? And we'll have a long list of, of questions on the paper. Um, and so then our team, which again consists of myself, our designer, and our, our, our developers, will go back through those questions and just say, okay, if we ask this question in this way, what answer might we get? And what we're looking for is, again, is are we asking this in a way that's gonna lead them down like a, a path? Because we don't wanna lead the customer anywhere. We want them to lead us. So we'll, we'll keep tweaking the questions until we you know, make it such that we're not, we're not biasing them. Um, and then again, we want to make sure the question is helping them describe problems to us rather than like the way they currently do things because we want to know the problems that are underneath that. So really like the, the best way for this, I found is just doing multiple drafts, getting multiple eyes on it. So like once our team has, has kind of gone through that first draft process ourselves, like I'll give that to another product manager at Pluralsight or I'll give that to you know a whole different team just so that they look at it with a fresh set of eyes and help us recognize any biases that we might have put in there. And that's kind of the process that we'll go through to, to get that before we talk to customers. Do you, um, in general, do you have any like, rules for, like, you can only ask this many questions because this much time is part of the interview, or uh, like five questions, or ten questions? Um, we don't have any rules on like, only this number of questions, but, but yeah, I mean, time is always an issue. So like, you know, when you set up the interviews, like you need to be clear with the customers how much time you plan to take. For us, our interviews are normally, you know, anywhere, it's usually around 45 minutes or so. Um, so you wanna make sure you ask the most important stuff first. I mean, I think that's, that's critical. Um, and then if you find you're kind of bummed up against time, with, uh, in an interview with a customer, I just think it's important to be respectful of that, say, hey, we're about out of time, like, um, I did have more questions if, if you can stay later, but if you can't, you know, that's okay too. So, um, we will kind of try to estimate, like, before we actually talk to customers, like, 
we have 20 questions, like is it likely we'll be able to fit all those in in 45 minutes? Probably not. Um, are there any we can eliminate? Can we combine some? Um, so that, yeah, it's definitely something we try to think about before we have the interviews. Yeah? How many interviews do you do for a typical feature? Um, that, so he asked how many interviews we do for uh, a typical feature. It really depends on how big the thing is we're working on. Again, if this is like a, like a, a plus one or just a small improvement, we may do zero to you know two or three interviews. You know, if we feel like we already know what's happening. If it's kind of a large experience, um, we could do like thirty or forty. Really, the number we're looking at is not the number of interviews, but it's our confidence level that we understand the customer pain or problem that we're solving. So what I found is that usually after like five, ten interviews or something for like a large feature or product experience, you'll start to recognize themes. Um, like customers start to say the same thing, and once you start to hear the same thing over and over and over, like you know, okay, we've we've probably like dialed into the right thing. If you, you find that everybody's kind of saying all over the map, like you probably need to keep doing interviews until you know you start to hit on like what those those themes are. Yeah, Good question. I'm curious to know a little bit more about the logistics. Who do you have typically uh, guiding the discussion? Uh, what are you using to record? So, um, I think, uh, I don't think it matters really who guides the, the discussion. Usually on our, like, on our teams, it's, it's the product manager, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, there's kind of, so we'll like I said, always have the product, the UX, and the, and the dev, at least one dev there. And there's really three roles that we have in the interview. So one person is, is guiding and directing the discussion with customers. The other person is, is taking notes so that that person who's guiding it doesn't have to worry about trying to focus on the conversation and take notes. And then the third person, uh, we try to have them watch for like body language and kind of nonverbal cues so that we're capturing like all the information that a customer might be giving us. Um, again, I don't think it matters like which of those three people does what, as long as everyone feels comfortable with that role that they have. So, I mean, for us, I usually guide the conversation. Um, Tony, who's our UX guy, he's usually taking notes, and then Chad, our developer, he's usually looking for the body language. Um, and then, as far as recording, uh, we use blue jeans. Um, you can use anything. I mean, any. So, if you can do the interview in person, you know, you can just record the audio on. Your phone, but if you're doing it through a video call, like any type of video conferencing software, whether it's Zoom or you know, Blue Jeans or Skype or whatever, I think you can record on most of those. Um, yeah, so we'll just record those for the notes later. Are you only interviewing customers or are you also seeking out non customers? So, how do you find customers or potential customers? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, who we interview really depends on what we're building. Uh, if we are building, yeah, if we're building something for customers, I guess we'd obviously talk to them, but if it's like, we're trying to solve a problem to make a non-customer a customer, we'll, we'll try to seek them out. How we identify those, um, if they're customers, we, we have like a list of all their emails. So we, we have actually someone on our team who helps kind of make sure that we're not hitting the same customers over and over again. They're kind of managing to make sure that, yeah, that we're not, too much of a burden on the same people. Um, if it's a non-customer, it really could come from anywhere. I mean, you've got to be a little creative, but you, know, you could look at competitors, you know, customers. Um, you might look at industry lists. I mean, there's, I guess there's really a number of places those could come from, and, and we use all of those things to try to identify who, who those people are. Yeah. It seems to me that for like, um, strategy has become a little bit more focused on content Good question. So, uh, very good question. So we we spend a lot of time um, on, we have a whole team that kind of focuses on personas of who our customers are. So they're always doing customer re research of, yeah, like who is our customer and like really writing out like 
this type of person, this profession. Um, so we're really dialed in on like exactly who the customer is. So that when we're reaching out for customer interviews, uh, we're looking for the people that matches that persona that we think is our customer. Now, sometimes you get in an interview and you find out very quickly that you're talking to the wrong person. Um, and you can just usually tell, like especially if you've done a bunch of interviews already, you can usually tell, like, oh, they're answering this from a position, like maybe they're not the buyer, or maybe they're not the decision maker, or maybe they're not the end user. And so the way they answer the questions is like way off from what you're expecting. Um, that does happen sometimes, and if that does happen, um, usually what we try to do is find a very polite way to end the interview. We'll just say, you know, we'll ask two or three questions, and then we're like, hey, we really appreciate your feedback, this has been super helpful. We'll reach out if we have more questions, thank you. And, and you just kind of, you know, you don't want to waste your time talking to the wrong, wrong people. Um, but in order to get the right people, I think the key is knowing very clearly like, who the customer is. Um, and, you, and, and being very specific. Uh, what industry are they in? What is their role in that company? Um, what kind of budget does this person have? Yeah. All of those things, like you, you have to know the answers to those questions so that you're making sure that you talk to the, yeah, the right person. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you guys, appreciate it.